Hey, early risers, how you guys doing this morning? Hey, thank you so much for getting up early to worship with us. It really does make a difference. You know, at our 11 o'clock service, we're really being sort of overcrowded, especially in children. So if you have children that are like uh, fifth grade and under, man, if you can keep coming to this service, that really, really helps us. So thank you. And I know some of you are not even early risers normally, but you came here. God bless you. Really glad you're here. Hey, if you happen to be here for the very first time, my name is Brian. Anderson. My name, uh, I'm one of the pastors here. I'm going to be giving the message out of the Bible in just a moment. So if you have a Bible or you have an app, open it up to the book of John, John chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 46 in a moment. You know, I want to to welcome you to week two of the Real Jesus campaign. And like David said on the video screen, we had a great start last weekend. Super, super excited about this campaign. And we've been telling you, you know, I've been telling you for weeks now, that we want every one of you to get everything out of this campaign that God wants you to get. And we believe that if you will make a commitment to three things, just three things, during this campaign, that you will receive everything that God wants you to receive. Those three things are regular weekend attendance for the six weekends that we're talking about this campaign, the, the real Jesus. And by the way, you're on week two. So two for two, way to go. You only got four more, you're doing great. And then second of all is to commit to join a small group. And at the small group, you're going to watch a DVD teaching that supplements what you just learned from me on the weekend. Like last weekend, it was about the Jesus of history. And then that's what Rich Nathan, and by, by the way, Rich Nathan was one of my best friends in the entire world. He pastors the uh, Vineyard Church in Columbus, Ohio. And it's a great teaching. So this week, you know, I'm talking about Jesus the teacher. So in your small group, you'll be learning more about Jesus the teacher. So you go to the small group. That's where you get your book for the, for when you, the first time that you go. And then in, in the book, there are five daily devotions per week that not all seven days but five per week that we want you to do that's the third thing we want you to commit to is doing the five daily devotions per week if you do those three things you're in a small group you're here every weekend for the six weeks and you do the devotions you'll be amazed amazed at what God does in your life in revealing to you just so much about the real Jesus All right, before we get into the scripture, we're going to receive our offering. So if the ushers want to come forward, and you know, I know so many of you are incredibly generous with your finances to God through our church, and I just want to remind you, you know, when we do that, it really does matter in all kinds of ways, but one of the ways it matters is it it helps people that are going through difficult times. You know, we have a food bank, like you saw on the video screen, and we do a a food drive a couple times a year, but that just makes a very small dent in the amount of food that we give away. We give away, you know, we we give away food for about 200 and clothing for about 200 families every single week. And those are just some of the things that we can do to help our community because of our financial giving. So it does matter. Thank you. May the Lord bless you whenever you give back to him through our church. So we're gonna pray, ask God to bless the offering. Most importantly, let's really open our hearts to God right now and say, God, would you speak to me about the real Jesus this morning? Would you speak to me? Would you pray with me? Lord, we ask that whenever we give financially to you, that you would use our money, not only to lift up the name of Jesus, we certainly want it to do that, but also that you would use it in tangible ways to help people, Lord. Thank you for the gift of being able to partner with you financially in what you're doing in the world. Bless our gifts and bless us, Lord, in our faithfulness in giving back to you. And now, God, as we want to worship you by studying your word and learning more about the real Jesus, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would really speak into every heart and into every mind, whatever it is that you know needs to be spoken to them. And and Lord, for that to happen, I need your empowering as I deliver this message. And so I'm praying for myself right now, Lord, that you would fill and empower me, you'd give me the gift of teaching, and that I would teach the things that you want me to teach. So come, Lord, have your way right now, I pray, in every one of our lives, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want you to think for a moment about somebody in your life who you have thought of as a really great teacher, 
a really great teacher. Maybe it was an elementary school teacher. Maybe a middle school. Maybe a high school teacher. Maybe a coach you had. You know, maybe an art teacher, a music teacher. Maybe a pastor. Maybe a youth leader that you had. But they were a really great teacher for you. Okay, you got that person in your mind? What was it that made them a really great teacher? You know, educational experts, they tell us that all great teachers share at least four common characteristics. And the first one is that great teachers set high expectations for their students. High expectations. I don't know about you, but my favorite teachers in high school, they weren't the ones who just gave everybody an A and you didn't really have to work very hard. I mean, I didn't mind that. But they weren't like my favorite teachers. My favorite teachers were the ones who, you know, really set the bar pretty high. In fact, my most favorite teacher in high school is my U.S. history teacher, Mr. Johnson. And he was the hardest teacher I ever had in high school. He set the bar really high. But he also taught in a way that was so fun and so engaging. But that's what great teachers do. They set the bar really, really high. Second characteristic of great teachers is that they form strong relationships with their students. You know, a lot of teachers really love the subject matter that they're teaching. You know, maybe they're really into history and that's what they're teaching or really into geography or math or English or whatever, but they don't really love the students that they're teaching. You know, maybe their classroom style is kind of intimidating. But truly great teachers, man, they're accessible. They form strong relationships with their students. Third characteristic of great teachers is that they're masters of their subject matter. They constantly spend time gaining new knowledge about whatever their particular field of study is. And not only that, but they also instill a hunger in their students to acquire more knowledge in that field of study as well. And then the fourth characteristic of great teachers is that they teach in ways that are memorable. Memorable. You know, did one of your favorite teachers or maybe a coach, maybe a pastor, did they have certain sayings about the things that they were teaching you that really stuck with you? That's what great teachers do. They teach in ways that are memorable. Now, last weekend, like I told you, we began our Real Jesus campaign, and if you weren't here last weekend, what we're trying to do in this series is we're trying to dig beneath all of the tradition and all of the religion and myth concerning this person, Jesus, so that we might encounter the real Jesus. We want to encounter the real Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago in a small town called Nazareth in an area called Galilee. We want to encounter the real Jesus who not only lived 2,000 years ago, but as a result of his resurrection is also alive today. And he's changing people's lives today. In fact, last weekend, 41 people came forward to publicly commit their life to Jesus Christ, the real Jesus, the real Jesus. And so if you were one of those 41 people, man, I am so, so proud of you. But I also want you to know, if you were one of those 41 people, you have a next step. And your next step, according to Jesus, is that you need to be water baptized. And we're going to have a water baptism coming up November 16th and 17th, that weekend. And so make sure that you put that on your calendar, November 16th and 17th. We'll have classes about baptism. You have to take one of those leading up to that date, but that's your next step. Don't just blow that off. That's a super important next step. Now, teaching. Teaching was one of the main activities of the real Jesus while he was on the earth. I mean, we constantly find Jesus teaching in in the temple. We find him teaching in synagogues, different synagogues, as he traveled around. We find him teaching in people's homes. Sometimes he taught crowds of people. Sometimes he taught just small groups 
of people like his disciples. We find him teaching men. We find him teaching women. And not only that, Jesus continues to teach today by his Holy Spirit, which he pours out on every single person who puts their faith in him. I had to turn to John 12, or excuse me, John 14, verse 26. Jesus said, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, I want you to underline the rest of this verse, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus is still teaching today, and he is a great teacher, a great teacher. But the fact is, you will never really understand the real Jesus until you encounter him as your teacher. Not just a great teacher, but he has has to become your teacher. So what I want to first look at (coughs) this morning, excuse me, is how does the real Jesus resemble other great teachers? You know, think about the four characteristics of great teachers that I just talked about a moment ago. Do you think Jesus had those qualities? You know, for example, great teachers set high expectations for their students. Did Jesus do that? Just think about the most famous teaching that Jesus ever gave. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It wasn't really a mount, but they called it the Sermon on the Mount. It's a Sermon on the Hill, really. It's a little hill that he taught from. It's found in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And look at these statements from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 20. But I warn you, Jesus says, unless your righteousness is better than then the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Is that high enough for you? Better than the righteousness of the people that were thought of as the most righteous of their day? Matthew 5, 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Whoa, it's a pretty high bar, right? Matthew 5, one of my favorites. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You think Jesus set some pretty high expectations of his followers? Or how about great teachers love their students? Do you think Jesus loved the people that he taught? Of course he did. In fact, he loved them so much that he died for them. Jesus loves his students. You know, third one, great teachers always teach in ways that are memorable. You think Jesus ever said anything, taught anything that was memorable? You know, for those of you that have read the Bible a little bit, or maybe you've been in the church a little while, anybody remember a teaching of Jesus about somebody called the prodigal son? Sort of memorable. How about somebody called the Good Samaritan? Remember that? Remember the story that Jesus taught about the sower and the seed? How about this one? Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them what? Do unto you. Almost every one of you have that memorized. Jesus taught in ways that were incredibly memorable. You know, in so many ways, the real Jesus in the Bible has the qualities that other great teachers have. But, but, the real Jesus was also a unique teacher. You say, well, Brian, what do you mean? How did the real Jesus' teaching differ from other great teachers? Let me give you three ways. First of all, The real Jesus' teaching is incredibly wise. Incredibly wise. Look at Matthew 13, verse 54. It says, Jesus returned to Nazareth, his hometown, and when he taught there, see, he's teaching, in the synagogue, 
everyone was amazed and said, where does he get this wisdom, underline wisdom, and the power to do miracles? See, the real Jesus was wiser than anyone who had ever lived. Now you might say, O'Brien, what exactly do you mean by wisdom? Well, wisdom in the Bible basically means skill in how to live life. See, wisdom is skill in relating to God, and it's also skill in relating to all different kinds of people. Jesus was able to relate not just to people who were like him. He was able to relate to all different kinds of people. That's what really wise people are able to do. See, wisdom is not only the ability to relate to God, but it's also the the ability to relate to rich people and at the same time to poor people. You can relate to wise people and foolish people. You can relate to young people and old people. You can relate to people who are Democrats and people who are Republicans and people who are independents. Wisdom means you have the ability to relate to people from your own race, but also the ability to relate to people who are from a different race than yours. See, wisdom is skill in relating to God and skill in relating to all different kinds of people. Let me ask you, are you wise? And not only that, but wisdom is also skill in relating to all kinds of situations. Not just relating to God, not just relating to other people, but to every kind of situation. It means you have skill in relating to sickness and skill in relating to health and skill in relating to people who are going through problems with their teenagers You have skill in relating to young parents and the problems they're going through. You have skill in relating to people who are growing old and people who are dealing with aging parents. That's wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to relate to people who are in poverty and also people who are in prosperity. You have wisdom on how to relate to difficult children and workplace hassles and sexual temptation and marital challenges. Wisdom is skill in relating to God, and in relating to all kinds of different people and all kinds of different situations. Jesus was and is the wisest person who ever lived. Now, in secular society today, the experts tell us that the answers to life's problems can be found in science. You know that if we just devote ourselves to enough research and enough study, then we will find the answers to the problems that we're facing. But you know what? Science can only take us so far. I love science. We need to follow all the scientific you know, uh, 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 information and research that's being done in all kinds of areas. Science is super helpful. We are not in any way anti-scientific here at the Vineyard. We're pro-science. But the truth still is, science is not going to answer every problem in life. See, science can reveal to us the mechanics of how something works. But it can't reveal to us the purpose of that particular thing. So addressing the mechanics won't ultimately solve all the problems that we face. Now, when you think about the issue of mechanics, you know, one of the ways you can think about it is this epidemic that we have in our country called male ED. Male erectile dysfunction. I mean, just think of all the ads that we see everywhere for Viagra, Cialis, you know, all the different drugs. And I know there are some men who deal with 
uh, with uh, erectile dysfunction that they have a physiological problem. That's why they're dealing with that. Or they may have some kind of an emotional problem or whatever. And if a pill can help that, man, praise God. We thank God for medicine. God uses all means to heal people. But for many men, I wonder, I wonder, if the bigger problem is a loss of the wise teaching of Jesus about the purpose of sex. Say, the purpose of sex. Say that out loud. The purpose of sex. I mean, could the need for all these drugs in America indicate that many men's sexual performance has been affected by the massive use of pornography in our country? Could that possibly be a reason? Do you know that therapists are reporting that scores of men in their 20s are dealing with this problem and needing these kinds of drugs in their 20s? See, when men and women misuse the God-given purpose of sex, they're probably going to struggle physically. Well, thankfully, the purpose of sex was taught by the real Jesus. In Matthew chapter 19, he says this, Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied. They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, Let no one split apart what God has joined together. See, Jesus tells us that sex is part of the unity between a man and a woman in marriage. See, marriage is is a unity of heart and a unity of mind and a unity of spirit and a unity of body. Sex is is a physical sign of a much larger relational unity between a man and a woman in marriage. So science can tell us about the mechanics of sex, but it can never speak to us about the purpose of sex. Only the real Jesus' wise teaching can tell us why we engage in sex to begin with. It's to complete the unity between a man and a woman in marriage. It's to complete that unity. That's the purpose of sex. So let me ask you, do you think Jesus is a wise teacher? Do you think Jesus has more skill in dealing with life and dealing with how life works than you do? I know he certainly has much more skill in dealing with how life works than I do. Or how about this? Do you think Jesus has more wisdom, more insight, more skill than any of your friends who are giving you advice about what you need to do about your boyfriend? Or what you need to do about your girlfriend? Do you think Jesus knows more about, your, uh, about sex than your best friend does? Do you think Jesus knows more about how to respond to mistreatment than your best friend does? Do you think that Jesus knows more than anyone else about how life works? I do. So here's the question. If you think Jesus' teaching is wise... Do you listen to him? Do you listen to him? Well, you know, the real Jesus is teaching how it differs from other great teachers. It's not only incredibly wise, but it's also authoritative. Authoritative. You know, the Apostle John tells us that the crowds were amazed because Jesus was able to teach so wisely without having any formal training. Look at it says in John 7. The people were surprised when they heard Jesus. 
How does he know so much when he hasn't been trained? So Jesus told them, my message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. And anyone who wants to, be, wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or it's merely my own. See, they were astonished that someone who had not studied in one of the you know, great rabbinical schools of that day or studied under some famous rabbi of that day could have such a command of Scripture. And not only such a command of Scripture, but such depth of, under, of understanding of God and, and how you know, God's will is supposed to be fulfilled in humanity. See, Jesus says that his authority did not come to him through the typical rabbinic chain of the first century where a rabbi teaches some students and then a student eventually becomes a rabbi who then teaches other students and it's passed down that way. No. No, instead, the real Jesus, he says, derived his authority directly from God. Look back at verse 16. So Jesus told them, my message is not my own. Underline this part. It comes from God who sent me. His, author his teaching is authoritative. Now what would it mean for you to say that the teaching of Jesus is authoritative in your life? What would that mean? It means you have to bring your entire life. Your entire life under the teaching of Jesus. If you want the teaching of Jesus to be authoritative in your life, it means you bring your mind, now listen to this, and your opinions under the teaching of Jesus. It means you bring your opinions about politics under Jesus. It means you bring your opinions about immigrants under Jesus. It means you bring your opinions about divorce under Jesus. It means you bring your opinions about race under Jesus. It means you bring your opinions about marriage under Jesus. It means you bring your opinions about everything under Jesus. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. What matters is the teaching of Jesus. The teaching of Jesus. See, it's impossible for a person to really accept Jesus as their teacher and then say something regarding, you know, say something regarding something that Jesus taught, like, well, you know, I know Jesus says that, but I disagree. I disagree. See, the reality of our claim to be followers of Jesus is called into question precisely at these points in which we substitute our own opinions for what Jesus actually taught. But you know what? The teaching of Jesus is not only authoritative over our, our opinions and our minds, it's also authoritative over our relationships. Our relationships. I mean, to be a student of Jesus means that you bring all of your relationships under the teaching of Jesus. That means for those of you that are married, you bring your marriage and how you do your marriage under the teaching of Jesus. For those of you that are not married, single, divorced, widowed, you bring your singleness under the teach of, teaching of Jesus and how you do your singleness. It means you bring all of your relationship, your relationship with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, you bring it under the teaching of Jesus. If you have children, you bring your child raising under the teaching of Jesus. It means you bring your relationship with your parents under the teaching of Jesus, with your friends, with your coworkers, with your boss, with your employees. You bring all of your relationships under Jesus. Do you think the teaching of Jesus really is authoritative? If you think that, here's the question. Do you obey him? If you think it's authoritative, do you obey him? 
And you know what? The good news is Jesus gave us a very clear test of how to figure out whether or not the, the teaching of Jesus was from God or not. He gave us a clear test. Look back at verse 17. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know, underline the word know, will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely my own. Let me speak for a minute to those of you who struggle, at least at times, with doubt. You know, maybe you are having a hard time figuring out who Jesus really is. And if the truth were known, you're like, you know, Brian, I just, you know, I'm not sure who Jesus really is. Maybe you struggle with the fact that Jesus really is God come in the flesh. I mean, if that's you, you might be thinking, well, Brian, you know, I, I read an article on the internet, said this about Jesus, and then I read another article on the internet by somebody else that was supposedly a, an expert, and it said this about Jesus, and it was completely different. And then I watched a show on the Discovery Channel about Jesus, and it said one thing, and then I come to church, and, you know, the pastor said something completely different about Jesus. I mean, Brian, how do I really know who the real Jesus is? Well, Jesus says that the best proof of who he is and where his teaching is from is not out there somewhere. It's not external. No, the best proof of who Jesus really is, is internal. He says there's a self-authenticating way for you to really know who Jesus is and deal with whatever doubts you might have about the real Jesus. It's a self-authenticating internal way where you don't have to listen to everybody else and what their opinions are about Jesus. See, the self-authenticating internal way for you to know who Jesus is and where his teaching comes from is to actually do his will. That's how you find out. To actually do his will. Look back at verse 17. The first part of that. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or not. But unfortunately, that's what so many of us don't do. We don't actually do the will of God. We don't actually do the words of Jesus. Instead, we debate about the meaning of the words of Jesus. You know, maybe we read what Jesus says and then, you know, we think about it and then we say, well, I'm going to go away and pray about what Jesus says. And then we decide whether or not we're going to obey him. Jesus says the way that you're going to know who he is and where his teaching is from is to actually do what he says. To do it. Don't just discuss it. Don't debate it. Don't go away and pray about it and all that. Just do it. Do your best to do his will. And you know what will happen? Once you begin to do his will, you know what you're going to find out? His way works. It works. And once you figure out his way works, you know what's going to happen? Many of your doubts about who Jesus is and the teaching of Jesus will begin to wash away. The teaching of Jesus is authoritative. And the third way the teaching of Jesus differs from other great teachers is because Jesus taught mainly, mainly, about himself. You ever thought about that? Most great teachers, they don't teach about themselves. But Jesus taught a lot just about himself. For example, Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth. I am, he says. I'm not going to show you a way. I'm the way. And I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
You know, not only did Jesus say that his teaching is true, he said he is true. He is true. I mean, unlike every other great teacher, the main subject that Jesus taught about was himself. You know, other teachers, what do they do? They teach you a body of information. You know, they teach you about chemistry, or they teach you about history, or geography, or whatever. But the main thing that Jesus taught about was himself. You know, John Stott, he was a great Christian author and pastor. He wrote a book called Basic Christianity. And here's part of what John Stott said in Basic Christianity. He said, Jesus' uniqueness was completely unselfconscious. He didn't need to draw attention to it. It was a fact so obvious to him that it didn't need emphasizing. It was implied rather than asserted. Everyone else was a lost sheep. Jesus had come as a good shepherd. Remember Jesus teaching about himself being the good shepherd? To seek and to serve them. Everyone else was sick with the disease of sin. Jesus was the doctor come to heal them. Everyone else was trapped in the darkness of sin and ignorance. Jesus was the light of the world. Everyone else was a sinner. Jesus was born to be their savior and would die for the forgiveness of their sins. Everyone else was hungry. Jesus was the bread of life. Everyone else was dead in wrongdoing and sin. Jesus could be their life now and their resurrection in the future. Jesus continually, continually, over and over and over, taught about himself. I'm the light of the world. I'm the salt of the earth. I'm the, I'm the bread of life. I'm the living water. Continually taught about himself. Now you might say, okay, Brian, but you know, there are a lot of people that are, talk about themselves all the time. It's all they talk about, you know? A lot of narcissism in our culture. Well, here's the difference with Jesus. We find in Jesus a combination of the self-centeredness of his teaching and the unself-centeredness of his behavior. John Stott goes on and says, in thought, Jesus put himself first, but in deed, last. Jesus exhibited both the greatest self-esteem and the greatest self-sacrifice. Jesus knew himself to be Lord of all, but he became servant of all. Jesus said that he would come one day to judge the world, but he washed the feet of his friends. Let me ask you one last question. If you think the teaching of Jesus is true about himself, do you come to him? Do you come to him? Do you come to Jesus on a regular basis? I mean, Jesus repeatedly pointed to himself as the answer to life's questions. He didn't give us a philosophy. He didn't give us a worldview. He gave us himself. And so whatever circumstance you find yourself in right now, whatever situation your life is in right now, what you need most is Jesus, the real Jesus. We don't need a principle. We need Jesus. And the good news is Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you come to Jesus? Have you come to Jesus recently? Let's come to Jesus right now. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we welcome more of your presence right now. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come in such a way that every person would be able to come to Jesus in their heart right now. No matter what their circumstances are, no matter how far or near to you they are, Lord. Help them to come to Jesus, the real Jesus. 
the Jesus of history, the Jesus who's a teacher. You know, maybe as you come to Jesus in your heart, just being an attitude of prayer, everybody, but maybe as you come to Jesus in your heart right now, maybe there's something that you need to get right with him. You know, maybe you've never fully submitted yourself to Jesus as your teacher. You can do that right now. Jesus, I want to make you my teacher. But remember, in order to do that, you have to bring everything under his authority. Everything, your opinions, your politics, your thoughts about race, your thoughts about sex, your thoughts about gender identity, your thoughts about money, your thoughts about giving, your thoughts about marriage. If you're willing to do that, then just say to Jesus, Jesus, I want you to be my teacher. I want your wise teaching on how to live life to guide me. Maybe there's something that you need to repent of in your heart right now. Just do that before you leave. There's no reason that every one of us, before we leave, can make sure that our life is right with the real Jesus. You know, whenever we mess up, whenever we sin, we just come to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you please forgive me? You know, I haven't really put my opinions about everything under your teaching, and I want to do that. Maybe you just need to thank Jesus right now. Thank him. He's such a wise teacher. And you've been doing your best to follow his, his wise teaching. Doesn't make it easy to follow his teaching. Far from it. I mean, how in the world, in a secular way, can, you know, loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you, how can that really work? But man, it does. If you do it, it does. It just works. Sets you free. Maybe you just need to thank him for showing us how to live life. I'm so grateful, Lord. I'm not wandering in the darkness because you're the light of the world. I don't have to live spiritually hungry because you're the bread of life. You know, we're going to pray for people in a minute. And this is just going to last a couple more minutes, so just hang with me. But you know, I think before we pray for people, and by the way, let me just say parenthetically, next weekend, next weekend, we're going to talk about Jesus as our healer. And at the end of the message, we're going to pray for every single person who would like to be prayed for, for any kind of malady, physical sickness, emotional sickness, spiritual sickness, you know, whatever it is, relational, whatever. Jesus is a healer, and I believe Jesus is going to heal a bunch of people next weekend. So if you know people who are sick in some way, man, encourage them to come next weekend. Jesus is going to walk among us. He's going to heal people. But we're going to pray for people like we always do in just a minute up here at the front. And so if you have a prayer request of any kind, you know, before you leave, please come here, find one of the, the ministry team members, Tell them what's going on and ask them to pray for you. But I, th- I think, I think, there's a couple of you, maybe even more of you in here, that you've never, 
come to Jesus before. You've never come to Jesus before. In fact, maybe you were even here last weekend and I had people stand up that wanted to come to Jesus for the first time and man, you're, you're regretting it now. You're thinking, man, I should have done that. That was me. I prayed that prayer. Do it today. Today, when we dismiss the service in a minute, come up to one of these ministry team members and tell them, you know, I don't think I've ever really come to Jesus, but I want to. I want to surrender my life to him. You can begin your relationship, your journey with Jesus right now this morning. If you've never come to him, come to him today. Come to him today. All right, let's all stand. I want to pray a blessing over us. If the ministry team wants to come to the front, that would be great. And if you're a guest, don't forget to go by the information table or the information center and get some information. And if you haven't found a small group, right after the service, go to the information center. Lots of people in there can help you find a group that's just right for you. My wife and I have been visiting different groups. We've gone to two so far. Man, they've been great. I mean, just off the charts great. You're going to find a great group just for you, and you'll be amazed what happens in that group if you start attending over these next four weeks. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for your presence here among us. And I pray for all my friends as they go their separate ways now, Lord. Would you really bless each one of them? Bless them, keep them, cause your face to shine upon them. Lift up your favor upon them, God, and give them peace. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said... Amen. Say hi to some people on your way out. God bless you. We'll see you soon.